Thank you. Um, welcome back to the State of the Science meeting on lessons learned from SSA demonstrations. Uh, this is session three on return to work. Um, we have a, a paper prepared by Robert Moffat and Jesse Gregory. Um, and Robert is going to present on that paper for the next 15 minutes. After that, we will have a discussion uh, first by Hilary Hoynes and then by Kathleen Romig. Uh, after this, we'll have a five minute break um, and we'll have a next session, um, which will be session four. Um, and then at 1.50 Eastern, uh, we'll have 20 minutes of general discussion. So at any point over the next, um, between now and 1.50 Eastern, you can uh, submit any questions you have through the Q&A box on WebEx, as Austin just explained. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss both, has questions for both uh, papers at that time. Uh, now, we, for Robert Moffat on return to work, take away Robert. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, happy to uh, present today. I'm going to start off by just saying who I am. My name is Robert Moffitt. I'm a professor of economics at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And my co-author is Jesse Gregory. He's a professor uh, out in the wilds of Wisconsin, Madison. <laughs> and uh, we uh, want to thank SSA for inviting us to uh, do a paper, a report on this subject. I should say that uh, I thought I knew a lot about Social Security programs. <laughs> uh, I realized after doing this how little I understood I also realized uh, how a lot of the easy patch solutions that economists come up with <laughs> meet particular challenges and aren't so easy to implement once you understand the complexities of these programs, quite a few challenges. So let me first start off by saying something about the scope of the program. Uh, so, sorry, the scope of our paper. The scope of our paper is concerned primarily with how to encourage those who are already beneficiaries of DI or recipients of SSI to return to work, and preferably to return to work at moderately high levels at or above SGA, the social uh, substantial gainful activity level. So significant earnings, that's the goal. We have a couple of demos we review, which cover uh, reforms and attempts to uh, intervene at the application process. Those are an exception to the rule. Uh, those overlap a little bit with the next paper by Kevin Hollenbeck, which is more exclusively concerned with early intervention. So that's the scope. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do we do in this paper? We review 11 demonstrations based focused on return to work of the type I just described. Uh, we also um, summarize 10 broad lessons from the uh, uh, re demos we review. Uh, then we suggest seven programmatic changes, that is to say, kind of the kinds of reforms that one might want to uh, run demos in the future on. And then we also talk about the design of demonstrations and based upon the lessons we drew also suggest five considerations for new uh, elements and considerations when designing demos. Uh, we're only going to talk about a few of those. That's uh, we have 10 lessons, seven changes and five <laughs> design uh, issues. We cannot talk about them all. I'm afraid you're going to have to read the paper. You're going to highlight a few. Next slide, please. So we're going to start off with listing the demos. Next slide. Uh, so we have quite a few here. I'm not going to take the time to uh, uh, read, uh, spell the names of all those acronyms. Uh, we have alphabet soup here, but we do divide them into four categories. Uh, one is uh, uh, financial incentives, primarily allowing recipients to and beneficiaries to uh, not have their benefits completely eliminated once they work beyond a certain level, but instead have them only partially reduced. That's the classic type there. Uh, we also review some VR programs. I'm not going to talk a lot about those uh, in this presentation, but they're all in the paper. Uh, talk about three uh, about uh, which uh, attempted return to work for mental impairments. One quite old one, uh, TETD. One MHTS more recent, and one that's actually underway right now, the SED. Very interesting uh, demonstration. I encourage you to read about those uh, uh, if you haven't already. If you don't, not familiar with them, and then one we'll do, which is about expanding health insurance benefits. That was called the accelerated benefit demonstration. Next slide, please. Okay, so first lessons learned. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, we have 10 of them. I'm only going to pick out five here to highlight. Number one, uh, as I quote here, it is a quote from the paper, most of the efforts to increase employment earnings and labor force and engagement of SSDI beneficiaries in general have been disappointing. Uh, primary uh, case in point there is the so-called bond demonstration, which uh, reduced what we call the marginal tax rate to 50%, allowed recipients to have their benefits only reduced by one half for every extra dollar they earned. 
Uh, that had uh, null impacts on the earnings, uh, at least high earnings of beneficiaries who were in the experiment. That is to say, the experimental group compared to the control group. Um, it seemed to be that the uh, effects were the result of offsetting effects. Some people increased their earnings and other people decreased their earnings, but the net effect was zero, statistically insignificant. There was also a counseling component to it that did not really have any additional impact. Neural findings were arrived at there too uh, as well. Another case in point is the so-called pod demonstration, which intervened and reduced that Marshall type trade earlier in the beneficiary's time on DI. Uh, that also had no impacts according to the interim report that's just been released. We have to wait for the final report to see what the final results are. So, so what can we say there? Uh, if you're worried that uh, the low employment rates and earnings levels of DI beneficiaries are the result of the uh, cash cliff or some kind of financial work incentives, you can't say that this, these demos provide any evidence that that's the case. <laughs> so it's just kind of a negative finding, perhaps. Next slide, please. Uh, secondly, where earnings do rise, they never, almost never, arise above the substantial gainful activity level, which is point of the point of these demonstrations. By and large, they provide incentives, financial incentives, to work at or above SGA. Uh, employment does sometimes increase and sometimes significantly, but not earnings enough to go up above SGA. Uh, we raised the question here, it's a more policy question when we realized this finding, <laughs> whether or not uh, that should be a value. Should the, the uh, uh, Social Security Administration and Congress put value on getting uh, many I beneficiaries to work, to simply work any amount or at least uh, moderate levels of earnings, even if it's not above SGA? We pose that as a question. Next slide, please. Uh, we also found that these demonstrations, by and large, have no significant impact on uh, exit rates from the program, which, of course, uh, would be one of the desirable uh, attributes of the outcomes. Uh, that simply did not happen. Um, uh, correspondingly, the benefits that were received either did not change at all or they went up. Uh, they tended to go up because if you offer beneficiaries uh, more benefits if they work beyond a certain level, well, that's going to increase the benefit expenditure of the program, and that was not offset at all by uh, exits from the roles, which might have saved money. Next slide, please. Uh, in general, we uh, concluded the financial incentives, at least those that have been tried thus far, don't seem to work so well. Uh, and there we have to make, uh, we make in our report uh, an important point that does it not always realized. Everyone hates the cash cliff. Everyone hates having benefits reduced uh, from some positive amount to zero if you earn one dollar more above some cutoff threshold. Well, there's a big uh, research literature on this on other programs other than disability programs, and that literature has consistently shown that when you reduce, smooth out a benefit cliff and you reduce that sharp reduction, uh, there's no expectation that uh, labor supply or work uh, levels will increase on average. Uh, that's because they provide work incentives to some recipients, work disincentives to others. And that appears to be what happened in the bond uh, demonstration. The two uh, uh, effects were of opposite signs and they netted out to zero. That's established theoretically and it's a real world possibility and has occurred in many other programs. So we think that the whole smoothing out the benefit left, the past left, needs to be rethought from day one. Um, and we have no evidence that it's really going to have a major impact. Now, it's still possible that those tax rates of 50%, maybe that's still too high. Maybe you should just let's simply do not want to take advantage of that. Now, we don't have demos with lower uh, marginal rates of 50%, so that's a question. Next slide, please. Take up rates. A very important point here is that uh, the only a small number of DI beneficiaries actually take up these programs. Uh, the financial incentives are provided if you work above a certain level, very small fractions. Uh, uh, took advantage of these, at least in these benefits. I'm talking about the financial incentives demonstrations here. You're talking about three to four percent of the experimental group actually went into the benefit offset region. No more than 50, 15 percent in one of the bond stage two experiments. These are small, so not many people are taking advantage of it. So we have to we we raise the question in our report: um, What is the real residual work capacity of many DI beneficiaries? How much can they really work? No matter how much incentives you uh, offer them. Uh, these suggest that perhaps the residual work capacity is not extensive for very many people in the DI caseload. And maybe we should lower our expectations 
about what kind of impact we think we can get for the kind of demonstrations and financial incentives that we've been trying. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so that, that was five lessons learned. So I'm going to move on to the programmatic changes. There were seven of them. Uh, I'm only going to mention one. So next slide, please. Uh, and it has to do with the earned income tax credit. So um, the earned income tax credit uh, is a reform that's been tried in a number of other programs, uh, and uh, uh, particularly in the United States Income Tax Code. The UK tried it for a while. Instead of taxing people, instead of reducing their benefits, and no one likes to get their benefits reduced, <laughs> you know, no matter what the marginal rate is, you're, you're worse off if you lose those benefits. Uh, the earned income tax credit actually supplements earnings. And the evidence is that particularly on individuals who are on the margin, we're really looking at whether or not to work and really looking at the dollars and cents, saying, is it worth it or is it not worth it? The evidence out there is that if you provide them a supplement, at least up to a certain level, you can't increase it forever, but up, supplement up to a certain level, you get pretty significant work, uh, work incentives uh, and increases in work and earnings for those who are able to work. So uh, we suggest that be considered for future um, demos, uh, and that's the main one we discuss. Next slide, please. So demonstration designs out of our five, I'll mention two here, next slide. Okay, one is the volunteers. Our view on the volunteers is that, um, is what are different than other people's. The usual objection to volunteer experiments uh, is that they are not representative of the case though. The only people who volunteer are the people who are likely to want to work or think they can take advantage of it. We don't see anything wrong with that. We don't think that's a problem at all, to be perfectly honest. We think that even if you had a permanent program, which offered uh, uh, work, financial work incentives, they would still be the case. That only a small fraction of the case load would take it up. That's based upon those take-up rates we've already discussed. In fact, we think that this whole issue about volunteership, we thought what we should think about, it. we should think about permanent programs that are only intended to uh, affect and encourage a relatively small fraction of the, of the beneficiary and case load to actually go to work at significantly high levels. And in fact, why not have permanent programs that target people, target people from day one on uh, a, a card on people who are most likely to be able to take advantage of these programs and restrict these programs and give up on this idea that one day you're going to have 100% of the beneficiary caseload working. We think this is a very important point. We come back to it several times in our review. Next slide, please. Uh, more than tent to treat. I know that's been mentioned at least once in one of the other presentations. Most of these programs uh, uh, only compare the average outcomes for the experimental group to those in the control group, averaging over people who did not respond and those people who did. But if you only have three to four percent of the experimental group even responding, the intent to treat estimates are going to be small, <laughs> uh, no matter what you do. So uh, we strongly encourage uh, SSA and future demos to add more outcomes to be looked at, most probably the uh, effect of the treatment on the treated. That is to say, what's the impact for that three to 4% that did respond? How much did they increase their earnings? Uh, and take a look at that. So uh, we think that's important. We're gonna add that to the agenda. Next slide, please. Other suggestions, next slide. So we have a lot of things in the report and I see my <laughs> revised slide didn't get up here. So let me just tell you, we have a number of other um, uh, comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to read about them, we encourage you to read our paper. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so what's our conclusion? Uh, we did summarize the 11 demonstrations here, uh, as I started off saying, and we summarized the lessons learned. Ten of those, <laughs> we had uh, five, uh, sorry, um, uh, seven programmatic suggestions and five demonstration design questions. And we'll just give you with one bottom line, which I've already mentioned at least once, if not twice. <laughs> Uh, and that is two things, two things which are coupled with each other. One is perhaps our expectations for the fraction of DI beneficiaries that have sufficient work capacity, so residual work capacity uh, to actually take advantage of these programs, perhaps our expectations should be lowered for that fraction. And secondly, perhaps we should focus these work programs on those we can target as being most likely to respond. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, now we will hear from Kathleen Mimic. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm very excited to comment on this paper. I did a similar exercise in 2015, and I felt like this paper really deepened my understanding of these studies and then extended it to the ones that have wrapped up since I 
looked at all of these things. And I very much agree with those um, bottom line conclusions. And to begin, I would love to just review some of those major findings. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, before I kind of zoom back out and put these things into context. So a selection of those lessons learned. The first one is that most of these work demos do not significantly increase the, the measures that we're looking at most frequently, employment, earnings, labor force participation. And even when they do, earnings rarely rise above SGA on a sustained basis. So as a result, there are essentially never increases in program exits due to the work that people do in these demos and rarely reductions in SSDI expenditures either. And then the third major lesson was only a small number of SSDI beneficiaries, and the same is true for SSI, try the interventions offered in the work demos, probably because of limited work capacity. So that's what I'd like to really talk about the most, is what, what kind of work capacity do we expect? Because that was really one of the major implications of this review. So to be honest, these findings really didn't surprise me, and not only because I did a review like this myself, but because of the population that we're talking about. So I'm gonna explain why and go through some of the implications of these findings about what we might do next. Next slide, please. The medical criteria for disability benefits are very strict. SSDI and SSI are specifically designed for people whose disabilities preclude substantial work. And I think it's, it's worth going over what those criteria are. A severe ment mental or physical impairment expected to last at least 12 months or result in death. This disability must render a person unable to perform substantial gainful activity. That means earnings of about $1,300 a month. Anywhere in the national economy, regardless of whether such work exists, where the applicant lives, whether a job vacancy exists, or whether he or she would be hired. Given that very strict standard, one would expect that most beneficiaries are not able to do substantial work over a sustained period. If they could, we would have questions about whether entry into these programs was too easy. In reality, it's very difficult as shown in these statistics. Most applicants for both programs are rejected, even after all levels of appeal. Next slide, please. The second reason I'm not surprised to see low levels of work among demo participants is that these, this population by definition is in poor health. And this is dramatically illustrated when you look at death rates among the SSCI population. It's similar in the SSI population, dramatically higher among beneficiaries than among non-beneficiaries. These are not healthy people. And so their health introduces a work barrier that didn't, doesn't otherwise exist. Next slide, please. Another factor work, limiting work is limited education. This chart shows SSDI and education among SSI recipients is even lower. Disability itself can limit a person's education and limited education is strongly correlated with higher rates of disability. Education is a key indicator of social economic status and we know SCS is highly correlated with physical and mental health disability and longevity. So it's not surprising to know that people with lower levels education, lower levels of education disproportionately qualify for disability benefits. And those disabilities together with that limited education really limit people's labor market experience. The fourth factor um, that makes it difficult for beneficiaries to work is age. Age is another strong correlate with disability. The older a person gets, the more likely they are to become disabled. We have an SSDI chart here. The curve is a little bit less dramatic for SSI because SSI includes people who were born with a disability or acquired a disability as children, but SSI also skews older. It's more difficult for older workers to find jobs and to shift to other kinds of work on top of the other barriers this population faces. Next slide, please. Another factor is time out of the labor force. Again, we're looking at SSDI in this slide, but it's even more true for SSI where work history is more limited. But most SSDI applicants have been out of work for at least a year before they even apply. In addition, the application process for both programs can take months or even years if appealed, adding even more time out of the labor force. During this time, a worker's skills and connections atrophy, new employers are less likely to take on workers with substantial gaps in employment, and so we have another barrier to work. Next slide, please. In addition to all of these barriers, people with disabilities face lots of other employment barriers. 
employment discrimination, lack of workplace accommodations, transportation, public transit is often unavailable, inaccessible, and unreliable. Access to healthcare, especially the long-term services and supports that many people with disabilities need in order to work. So it's little wonder that few SSDI or SSI beneficiaries are able to do long-term self-supporting work, regardless of what we're doing in these demonstration projects. Next slide, please. And lo and behold, SSDI beneficiaries do fare poorly in the labor market. Same is true for SSI. Even rejected applicants, as shown in this chart, fare poorly in the labor market. So it shouldn't surprise us that those who do meet SSDIs and SSI's strict medical criteria also struggle to do self-supporting work, even when those interventions exist in these demonstrations. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the implications of all of this. I think there are really two ways of thinking about work and disability, and they are often in opposition to each other. First are the traditional metrics, budgets and caseloads. In the eyes of many policymakers, the lower the better. By these metrics, these work demonstrations have failed. But I think we should also consider an alternative way of looking at this, a more holistic way, and look specifically at the beneficiary's own preferences and to measure their well being more broadly. When you talk to disabled people themselves, as you always should when you make policies that affect their lives, you'll find many people with disabilities really want to work despite the many challenges that I just outlined. And you'll find that they reap benefits from that work. Improvements in mental health, community integration, economic security, and intangibles like a sense of purpose and connection. But as noted this morning, these metrics don't often show up. They're not even measured in these demonstrations. I find it instructive to compare the way that we think about work to the way that we think about education for people with disabilities. The Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, or IDEA, entitles disabled students supports that help them access school curriculums. It often costs significantly more to educate children with disabilities. They may receive specialized instruction, school-based therapies, have one-on-one -on -one aids, and so on. But if that's what it takes to access the curriculum, then they have a legal right to those supports. Even with this intensive and sometimes costly support, many students with disabilities don't perform at grade level but that's not necessarily the standard they're expected to meet. Instead, they're expected to make progress in terms of the individualized plans based on their own circumstances. Why do we see things so differently when disabled kids grow up to be disabled adults or when adults acquire disabilities? What if disabled adults were entitled to get the supports they needed to access the labor market? That might look more like long-term services and supports, which many disabled people can't access. What if we didn't expect self-supporting work for those with limited work capacity, but instead focused on well-being, like mental health, community engagement, which might benefits we might reap even from more limited work. We'd have to measure those things in, this, in our studies, and so far we're doing that in a pretty slipshod manner. What if we knew that most working beneficiaries would never reach SGA for a sustained period? we could consider topping up wages with an EITC-like subsidy like the authors recommend. But here's the catch. All of these things cost money. And if we go beyond a targeted group as the, these authors uh, recommended, and I think that's a good recommendation, it could possibly be a lot of money. But if it's true that encouraging work is our goal, it would be money well spent. However, if the real goal here is really just to save money by reducing benefit rolls, I'm afraid we're due for another round of disappointing demos. To conclude on a slightly more hopeful note, I think we have a lot of clues about a good direction for, um, for SSA's um, uh, future experiments. Uh, the slide is here, thank you. Um, but I need to wrap up so you can um, move on. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, now we're going to hear from Hillary Horns. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Hilary Hoynes. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley, and I'm delighted to have a chance to be part of this conference today, um, and in particular, to have the time to dig into the amazing uh, summary um, by the authors of this, um, of this paper. So um, following the very clear presentation that Robert gave, as well as Kathleen's excellent summary of a lot of their main points, 
I thought that I would use my time um, similar to Kathleen to talk about the broader context uh, for this work and some thoughts going forward. Uh, so I wanna sort of um, think about this in the context of just uh, three points. So you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and the first point is um, perhaps an obvious one, but, but one that I wanted to think about a little bit. And that is um, why the focus on work? Why is it that we're thinking about um, using these demonstration projects to learn about how to increase the employment of recipients of disability benefits? Why is that the focus of these kind of policy endeavors? So next slide, please. So I think as the authors talk about in their paper, uh, it's clear that an important backdrop for the interest and focus on work is the um, quite significant increase in beneficiaries and when more beneficiaries, higher costs, that you can see uh, in this slide, um, you know, really quite strikingly between around 1990 and uh, through the beginning of the Great Recession, where you see the steep increase in the SSI caseload. Next slide, please. But also true, and I think quite relevant in, in comparison or in addition to showing the increase in beneficiaries and costs, is the quite longer term trend of a decline in labor force participation and employment rates, particularly for men in the United States, which has been, um, you know, uh, the object of much attention in a, in a broad um, uh, research agenda, including work specifically on disability. What you can also see in this graph is that after a very long um, march of increase in labor force participation for women throughout much of the 20th century, around the year 2000, we see, see a sort of inflection point where labor force participation and employment rates uh, start to decline for women as well. So I think this sort of increase in costs uh, alongside a reduction in employment for the population more broadly is an important part of the motivation, I think, for why the interest in work. So next slide, please. In addition, uh, and has already been mentioned, uh, one also important factor that we see going on with the increase in beneficiaries is the quite dramatic change in the composition of health conditions um, around uh, the disabling work condition for recipients. And so this graph is for uh, SSDI, and uh, you can see the quite dramatic rise in musculoskeletal uh, conditions uh, that are justifying uh, receipt and the work disabling condition. So next slide, please. So despite these longer term trends, it's also worth pointing out, I think, something about the more recent history that is prior to COVID. Uh, so next slide, please. So the first thing that I want to point out, uh, as it, you know, is, was clear in that in that first figure that I that I showed you, is that the most recent past shows actual declines in the SSDI caseload. So on this chart, the dashed line is the original graph that I showed you, although only for uh, the years 2000 and, uh, and, and since uh, the year 2000. And the other line gives you the new awards uh, of SSDI. So the flows into the program year by year. Uh, the dash line is the total number of beneficiaries or the uh, sort of stock of, of recipients. And what you can see is this quite dramatic decline um, in the number of new awards starting around uh, 2010. Um, and that is, you know, sort of flattened out in the in the most recent years in this graph uh, that goes through 2019, as I mentioned uh, prior to COVID. Uh, next next slide, please. But something that has gotten a bit less attention is the uh, change in the labor force participation among folks who uh, declare themselves to have a disability. And so this comes from CPS data. Not this is. 
uh, uh, the green uh, line on this on this chart, and this uh, I should say this figure comes from a recent uh, summary piece by Nicole Mastis, and it points out that the uh, you know the connection with the labor market among those with disabilities has recently increased after a period of dramatic uh, decline, and so kind of putting this all together. Uh, it seems that we've got this sort of longer term trend of increases in the caseload and reductions in the connection to the labor market. Uh, but in the recent period, things look as though they're changing in ways that I think to date we don't fully understand. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, as a little bit of a, a shameless self-promotion for work in progress with Nicole Mastis and uh, uh, Alexi Strand from SSA, we're actually looking in to try to understand the role, uh, the, what's going on behind this decline in caseloads and the relationship, if there is any, to changes in employment. And what we focus on is um, the changes in the, the quite dramatic reductions in the allowance rate at the uh, hearing level for SSDI uh, eligibility uh, determination process. And you can see that those uh, allowance rates really started declining uh, after a period of um, some uh, um, important increases. And we are looking at the policy levers that led to those declines in allowance rates and using that to understand the role that the program and the policy is playing in um, earnings and employment uh, more generally. So a little bit of something related to this uh, to look forward to. So next slide, please. So the last uh, point that I want to make has to do with thinking about, you know, what we should, a sort of assessment of um, what to think about this broader um, research and demonstration projects and encouraging work uh, and the role that SSA policy should play in that. And I want to make uh, two comments on on this, uh, and that will uh, be, and then I will conclude. Uh, the first is that as we analyze uh, social safety net programs and their sort of optimality and and their structure, we we kind of think about that within the context of the trade-offs of the goal of policies uh, to promote insurance, so to provide cash assistance for um, individuals who are unable to work with the SSDI program. But we want to think about that in the trade-off between that and the desire to um, in, encourage work um, and, and create those sorts of incentives, which is very much at the core of what this paper uh, examines. And so it seems to me that what we need to know more about is the protective effects of uh, SSDI and impacts more generally on the well-being of the SSDI population uh, or the potential SSDI population. And just a little bit of a, a shout out to Manasi Deshpande's work on SSI that very much takes this lens of looking at the optimal uh, generosity of, of SSDI. Uh, next slide, please, which is my last slide. Uh, so the second thing that I wanted to just sort of circle back to around uh, policies uh, going forward is to, if uh, this paper, which shows very clearly uh, that these financial incentives uh, do little to change employment, really makes me as, you know, somewhat of an observer of this literature to step back and ask, should we be doing more earlier in the process? in order to try to uh, encourage more work. And so that uh, perhaps uh, provides a very good lead in to our next session um, on early uh, intervention. So uh, I will stop here and thank you very much. Thank you, Hillary. Um, and thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, we're now going to take a short break. We'll be back at 15 minutes past the hour to continue with our next session.
Hello, everyone. We will begin shortly. Hello, and welcome back to the State of the Science meeting on lessons learned from SSA demonstrations. We're now in session four on early intervention. Uh, we're going to hear from Kevin Hollenbeck, who's prepared a paper on early intervention. Uh, he's going to speak for 15 minutes, and that will be followed by discussion by Jeff Liebman and Jennifer Sheehy. Um, after they have, the discussants have spoken, we'll have 20 minutes of Q&A for both this session and the previous session. Uh, please, as we go along, feel free to add any questions you'd like to ask any of the presenters or discussants to uh, the discussion box um, on the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. Um, with that, uh, we can get started uh, with Kevin Hollenbeck speaking on early intervention. Take it away, Kevin. Administration for supporting this work and the uh, apt uh, associate folks for very ably administering the work, uh, providing very helpful reviews uh, along the way. Next, first slide. So my paper is on early interventions as Hillary Hoynes uh, gave me such a nice segue into the paper. Um, the definition that I'm using is that uh, an early intervention is a policy or practice that results in allowing individuals with disabilities to maintain or to achieve meaningful employment and earnings, and therefore foregoing applying for or reapplying for uh, DI or SSI. The benefits of an effective early intervention would be uh, reducing benefit payments, increasing payroll tax receipts, reducing administrative expenses associated with uh, applications, and hopefully to improve service efficiency for future applicants and beneficiaries. Next slide. My paper is uh, limited to adults age 25 and over with disability. Uh, the next paper in the session will be uh, in the conference, we'll be talking about transition youth. Um, I basically tried to triangulate the size of this uh, target population who might be influenced by early intervention uh, by looking at those with work related and non work related injuries uh, during a year, as well as those uh, applicants who were denied benefits because of employability. And between them, I came up with an estimate of an inflow annually of between 1.1 and 2 million individuals. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> These individuals are disproportionately over 45, persons of color, uh, worked in unskilled or semi-skilled occupations, and uh, have lower levels of education. Next slide. So there's uh, almost a logical inconsistency to want an agency such as SSA to promote or implement a policy or practice that's aimed at keeping potential clients away. It really emphasizes the importance of a randomized controlled trial design for demonstrations. So we know exactly whether the early intervention was effective or not. Because SSA has no carrot or stick for potential applicants, and may have lost its carrot and, or stick for applicants who were denied, it may, the agency may need to collaborate with a decentralized medical system, such as it's doing in the retained demonstration, which I'll talk about in a minute, or with slightly less decentralized agencies, such as community mental health or vocational re rehab agencies. Next slide. So in doing my work, I looked at the publications and information around five demonstrations, which are listed here and uh, which we heard about uh, throughout the day. Uh, the DMIE, the TANF SSI Disability Transition Project, uh, SED, uh, RETAIN, which I just mentioned, and promoting work through early intervention or PWIP. Uh, in a, Next slide. In addition to reviewing the evidence around those demonstrations, I reviewed some additional <coughs> evidence or papers, 
In particular, I looked at international experiences in the Netherlands, Sweden, and England. I looked at the early intervention chapters, uh, three papers from the McCrary Pomeroy uh, initiative proceedings. And then I reviewed some miscellaneous literature from authors who uh, suggested various early interventions. Next slide. Going through the demonstration evidence, uh, first, uh, the oldest of the, these uh, was a demonstration operated between 2006 and 2009 by CMS. Uh, in four states, basically, there was a treatment consisting of medical benefits and some financial assistance for healthcare. Uh, findings of note from this demonstration were basically uh, these this treatment, these treatments had no impact on employment or earnings, but in one state there was a reduction, a significant reduction in SSI or SSDI applications and in SSI recipients. Next slide. <clears throat> the TANF SSI Disability Transition Project was a series of activities basically trying to decide, determine whether TANF is a gateway into SSI. Among the activities, uh, the one I looked at in particular was a, uh, an RCT that was conducted in Ramsey County, Minnesota, uh, using um, uh, a treatment was, which was essentially the Individual Placement and Support Treatment, IPS. Uh, they called it uh, FAST. Um, in that uh, experiment, basically, they found a slight reduction in TANF take up but uh, there was no reported findings uh, regarding SSI or SSDI application or benefits. Next slide. The set demonstration is an ongoing demonstration uh, with uh, basically two treatments. Uh, the eligibility here is for uh, denied applicants who have a mental health issue. Um, it's ongoing. The enrollment was conducted in 2018 and 2019. Uh, there have been no outcomes reported yet, but the evaluator did a very nice uh, evaluation of who took up the offer of the treatment. And uh, if we use that analysis, analysis to generalize who might take up early interventions, uh, they found the following characteristics were uh, correlated with take up uh, males, higher levels of education, uh, individuals with limited work experience, and from areas where the unemployment rate was relatively high, but the average wage growth was also relatively high. Next slide. Retain is a very large scale demonstration that is also ongoing. It, SSA is collaborating with the Department of Labor Office of Disability Employment Policy. The treatment here is based on the principles developed uh, in COHE, which is uh, Washington State Centers for Occupational Health and Education. The treatment is mainly uh, focused on very timely intervention, a coordinator of health services, and centralized accessible data. Um, it's a two-phase demonstration. Phase one ran pilots in eight states. Five of those states are now uh, starting phase two to gear up and uh, do a randomized control trial uh, of individuals. Unfortunately, we won't see outcomes for a few years. Next slide. The final uh, demonstration I looked at was uh, Promoting work through early intervention. Excuse me. This is um, a project in collaboration between SSA and ACF. It is comprised of two um, studies. One is B's for building evidence on employment strategy, and the other is next generation of enhanced employment strategies or next gen. Both of these activities are more or less uh, just getting underway, uh, identifying uh, regions and programs to study. Of uh, interest is that the next gen is trying to find interventions involving employers or labor market broadly. 
uh, one finding of note here is that one site that bees is looking at is the breaking barriers site in San Diego, uh, extending work uh, from an evaluation that was done funded by the Workforce Innovation Fund of the Department of Labor, in which they uh, did an RCT using, again, the IPS treatment, but the evaluation report indicated no significant impact on the receipt of SSI or SSDI. Next slide. So, as I mentioned, I looked at selected international evidence. I really didn't find any experiments or demonstrations. In the Netherlands and Sweden, enacted reforms uh, intended to place more responsibility on employers and to centralize uh, and do more timely employability determinations. In fact, uh, the disability roles uh, decreased in those countries, but we can't uh, say anything about causality. In uh, England, they toughened the work capability assessment and time-limited benefits for those assessed as having limited capability for work. Again, uh, no causality uh, found in any papers. Next slide. Other early interventions suggested in the literature include experience rating the employer portion of the SSDI payroll tax, mandating private disability insurance, although there was a recent paper by Stepner and all that had some countervailing evidence about the efficacy of this. Uh, some authors uh, suggested some new institutions, uh, Dave Stapleton and others, the Employment Eligibility Service, uh, Christian and others, the Health and Work Service. And finally, there was uh, a, a paper suggesting systematic uh, offering of transition jobs to individuals uh, at risk of going on to the roles. Next slide. So the lessons learned are sort of the promising practices that come out of this literature is first of all, the importance of having a coordinator or case manager and centralized data. Secondly, timely intervention uh, after uh, medical events. And third, uh, there's been quite a bit of uh, experimentation, demonstration around individual placement and support. Uh, its employment efficacy has been shown in several studies. However, uh, there was no impact on employment or SSI, SSDI in either the transition, the transition, uh, I'm sorry, the, the TANF SSI transition studies or in the WIF funded breaking barriers uh, effort in San Diego. However, it is being widely tested in a very large demonstration in SEDS and both bees and next gen uh, want to look at it as well. Next slide. Um, the literature suggests that uh, targeting among uh, eligible individuals for early intervention may be feasible. As I mentioned, the uh, said enrollment uh, analysis uh, pointed out a number of characteristics that uh, one might uh, target upon. And finally, on the issue of employer responsibility, the Dutch and Swedish reforms basically uh, tried to put more responsibility on the shoulder of employers. However, there was a paper that indicated uh, in uh, the Dutch experience uh, a reduction in the hiring of individuals with disabilities. And furthermore, there's sort of the whole question of whether employers should be responsible for non-work related disabilities. Next slide. What can SSA do? Um, I, in the paper, suggest that one proposal where there seems to be a hole would be to look at um, job development and job search assistance for applicants age 50 and over. They are disproportionately uh, part of the population. And the rationale, of course, is they, they have two barriers, age and disability. So next slide. In conclusion, um, I take a quote from Lisa Ekman, uh, who wrote, there is neither completed research nor an evidence base upon which to enact nationwide early intervention or work support programs. I believe that uh, still describes the state of affairs uh, 
five years later. However, there seems to be two options underway, standardiza standardization and coordination at the regional level, which is being uh, tested in the retained demonstration and individualized assistance, which is being tested in the said demonstration. These are not necessarily in opposition to or mutually exclusive uh, options. Unfortunately, we're not gonna know the experimental demonstration impacts for a few years. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, now we will hear from Jeff Liebman. Thank you and good afternoon. I wanna begin by complimenting Kevin Holland back for writing an extraordinary chapter. To synthesize such a wide range of past and ongoing evaluations, plus international evidence, plus untested ideas, all in one place and in such an insightful manner, uh, it is really quite an impressive piece of work. The second thing I wanna say is how neat it is to see the Social Security Administration partnering with other federal agencies to undertake such creative and innovative demonstration programs. SED, RETAIN, COHE, PWIP, BEES, NEXTGEN. It is a really remarkable set of testing and learning that is going on. As, as Kevin notes, by the time SSA encounters an SSI or DI applicant, the ideal time to intervene may well have passed. So it is so important for SSA to be working with agencies that might encounter future DI and SSI applicants further upstream and who have deep expertise in the health and employment aspects of interventions. These initiatives show our federal government at its best as a learning, continuously improving organization and one that is capable of breaking down agency silos to provide better services. A few other thoughts occurred to me as I read Kevin's chapter. The first is that the sample sizes for many of these experiments are simply too small. The experiments are underpowered and it is going to be hard to learn anything conclusive from several of them. This is especially true if one does appropriate adjustment of the confidence intervals for the fact that there are multiple outcomes being measured uh, with results often presented separately for different sites. There are simply some cases in which one needs to make the tough call to not go forward with a five to 10 year experiment, no matter how innovative, if at the end of the day, budget constraints or sample recruitment challenges mean that the results are almost certainly going to be inconclusive. The second thing I wanna say is, I think we need to be clearer about what is motivating us to do early intervention. Uh, and here, uh, what I say uh, parallels some of what Kathleen and uh, Hillary said uh, a few minutes ago. One view is that we are trying to increase economic output and therefore our nation's standard of living by putting more people to work. Another view is that we're trying to reduce government spending by diverting people from claiming benefits. A third view is that we're trying to improve the well-being of people who are struggling with health impairments and labor market challenges by helping them get back on their feet. I think that if our primary motivation is either of the first two, we are probably destined to fail. The labor market prospects of people on the margin between receiving and not receiving DI and SSI benefits are just not all that great, even in the best of circumstances. Often the number of extra years in the labor force that can be expected, even if someone returns to work, is not all that high. The interventions are expensive, and if one does the benefit cost analysis properly and subtracts the worker's disutility of effort from the output gains, it is very unlikely we will design an intervention with output gains that exceed costs. The same is true if our motivation is government finances. These interventions typically serve quite a lot of people per person diverted from benefit receipt. Moreover, given that the beneficiaries tend to be low income workers struggling with health impairments and other challenges, people who deserve a high social welfare weight, you would have to believe the leaky bucket of our income transfer system is really leaky in order to think we're doing good when we reduce benefit spending. So I would argue that the main reason we should be designing, implementing, and evaluating early intervention programs is to improve the well-being of those we are providing services to. This perspective has at least three important implications. First, our primary outcome measures in our studies 
should be measures of well-being, pain levels, depression levels, substance use levels, divorce and domestic violence levels, happiness, longevity. Employment and benefit receipt may in some cases be useful proxy measures, but they should not be the main or only focus. In addition to being conceptually right, taking this approach to measuring a broader set of outcomes also makes it much more likely that we will find benefits of an intervention that are substantial enough to exceed costs. Second, I think a lot of us, me include, included, have a presumption that when we help someone get back to work, we are indeed doing something good for them. And conversely, that in telling someone we will give them lifetime benefits in exchange for never working again, we may in many cases be consigning people to misery. But we really haven't done the research necessary to know whether this is right on average, much less for which subpopulations this is correct. Someone should find a major study using the Masters et al. examiner assignment instrumental variable to compare well-being impacts of receiving versus not receiving SSI and DI. Because you would need to collect most of the outcome data directly from participants rather than by using administrative data, it would probably cost $20 million to do this right, but I think it's really worth it. Third, in all of our early intervention studies, and indeed in most social experiments, we should have an extra experimental arm where we simply give people extra cash for a few years equal to the per capita amount it costs to deliver the intervention. In determining whether our interventions are effective, we should be held to the standard that our interventions not only work, but that they work better than giving people the same amount of cash. I can't resist throwing out one uh, more intervention idea. I personally am not a fan of giving a guaranteed income to everyone in America. The amount of extra taxes it would take to fund such a program is prohibitive. But a guaranteed income for low earners struggling in the labor market facing health impairments, that seems much more appealing. I know it's a fantasy, but I would love to see us take one state and provide SSI and DI benefits to a targeted set of low earners with no strings attached, free of any limits on subsequent employment. Doing so would almost certainly increase benefit applications. If it improved well being and caused applications in the target population to double, I personally would think we'd done a good thing. If it caused applications to rise tenfold, or if it led more people to be in despair because of lack of purpose, I would think it was a disaster. Only an evaluation can help us determine which is more likely. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, now we'll hear from Jennifer Sheehy. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, thank you so much, Kevin. I want to echo Jeff's um, praise of your paper. Uh, we love seeing all of the different research projects, uh, the, the findings, the uh, lessons and challenges and um, it contributes to the work that we do at the federal level in the Office of Disability Employment Policy. I had my own spinal cord injury and return to work story and a lot of the work that we've been doing is driven by my desire to see that more people can benefit from kind of the perfect um, return to work uh, experience that I had. And I was a very grateful recipient of vocational rehabilitation and of SSDI. I used it as a temporary benefit to get me back to work, but without it, I uh, could not have continued on the career path that I have and do the work that I do today. So, so much of what we do is to look at policies that will scale those best practices to as many people that can benefit as possible. So some of the um, some of the the lessons and the the findings that Kevin pointed out in his paper really go to the definition of early intervention. And what I'm going to do today is talk about some of the key findings that drove us to start the RETAIN Return to Work grant project, and then some new policy uh, questions for the future. And 
again, thank you to SSA. Thank you to all the researchers and the presenters because the work you do, it, it, we look at it, we, we uh, live it, and we design our investments based on it. So it's critical and we very much appreciate it. So with regards to early intervention, there are many open questions. When is the right time to intervene? How early is early? What are the needs of the target populations and do the type of services offered meet those needs? Can the public workforce system meet the needs? And are there clear ways of identifying and serving the target population? Next slide, please. Some of the lessons that we've learned from the early interventions that Kevin pointed out, that they should take place as soon as possible after a work-threatening injury or illness. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about what a work disability is in a moment. That the individual's path after that injury or illness be case managed and coordinated, coordinated with employment and healthcare that we involve healthcare professionals who have been trained and accept uh, that staying at work and that work is a part of recovery and it's a recovery strategy. And it's a desirable outcome, so someone should return as soon as medically feasible. And that we target individuals or regions that have the characteristics um, that data suggest are likely to succeed, but of course, how do we target those um, populations? Uh, many of the early interventions that have been discussed consider early as uh, prior to application for SSDI or SSI or at the point of application. And uh, the RETAIN project, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about, is really looking at early um, the way we define it, which is days and very the first few weeks after a work disability. Next slide, please. So what is RETAIN? RETAIN is a um, demonstration that was in eight states for planning and pilot grants and is now in five states for full implementation phase two grants. Uh, RETAIN is designed to serve thousands of participants that um, have a disability related to a work, um, to workers who experience disability or an exacerbation of a condition that threatens their ability to continue working. The goals are to improve employment outcomes for newly injured or ill workers and reduce the need for SSDI or SSI. We're um, using RETAIN to develop policies that we can then look at legislative and uh, regulatory options for. But it's important to know uh, a couple things. One is that it's modeled after a workers' compensation program in Washington State, the COE model. And it, it's important to know what RETAIN is not. RETAIN is not an attempt to federalize state workers' comp uh, systems or, or programs. If states can learn from our grants and the return to work uh, strategies that uh, we hope to show are effective, that's terrific. But every state is individual, every region, the demographics, the industries, and we still, um, and we're not trying to impose federal standards on states. It is not an attempt to reduce SSDI benefits. As, as I mentioned, those benefits are critical for the people that need them. But if we can keep people working and reduce the need for applications uh, and reduce the applications so that people who truly need SSDI benefits, either temporarily or permanently, can have those, then that is a terrific goal. Next slide, please. So again, we're talking about early in the sense of uh, prior to 12 weeks following an illness or injury that affects someone's ability to work. 
And this is based on evidence from Washington State, but there is other research as well that shows that the return to work uh, dramatically declines after someone is out of work for 12 weeks. Next slide, please. So what are some of the key features of retain? So retain enrollees must be workers uh, actively working or looking for work uh, at the time that they uh, become participants and they cannot have already received or uh, have applied for SSDI or SSI. Workers are eligible if they have a condition either through occupational or non-occupational illness or injury that inhibits or affects their ability to work. And originally it was focused on workers with musculoskeletal conditions, but most of the programs and all of the phase two uh, state programs have expanded to serve workers with any condition that inhibits their work, uh, including mental health conditions. And this uh, and retain will serve those with work-related and non-work-related conditions, as I mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. What are some of the key challenges that we've noticed already with RETAIN? The early stages after work disability uh, really shaped someone's ability to uh, stay at work, return to work, and what those worker outcomes will be. The healthcare professionals that are in the return to work or workers' comp or just in the, the medical business of helping someone with a non-occupational injury or illness are not typically trained in occupational health best practices, or uh, they may not be thinking of employment as a critical goal that uh, they will be contributing to. The systems that serve individuals at risk of dropping out of the labor force are still fragmented and typically don't coordinate. For example, the workforce system uh, that is administered by the Department of Labor does not typically interact with health healthcare providers, but in Retain, we are looking at using the workforce system and um, healthcare partners in order to intervene early with workers who experience illness or injury and a disabling work disability. The target population is diverse and challenging to reach, um, and engaging in employers has also shown to be difficult. Some of the workers don't want us to interact with their employer. They, especially if it's a non-occupational illness or injury, they want to keep that health information private. And of course they should, that's their right. Um, but it is critical to work with employers to make sure that they can get the accommodations or um, a temporary or a part-time position but as they are trying to stay at work or return to work. I also want to mention here, that, and I think it's really critical um, as a principle of retain, that this is supposed to be a large scale, low cost intervention. Because we don't know a lot about the target population and what services will help every individual uh, stay at work if they can, then we are basically providing a low cost, um, very high volume intervention uh, with people in order to catch, for lack of a better term, the people that will benefit most and will be able to um, avoid applying for SSDI because they can sustain their, uh, their jobs and their economic stability without having to apply for SSDI. Next slide, please. So what are some of the future opportunities for shaping earlier intervention that we've uh, looked at? So one of them is establishing policies to integrate key networks to help workers stay at or return to the workplace after injury or illness. That is, you know, can we work with the workforce system? Uh, we've got the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act coming up, and are there policy changes that might help? 
in incorporating stay at work, return to work services into paid leave and medical leave, and looking at longitud longitudinal survey and administrative data. I will end there and uh, thank you again for including ODEP. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, we're now going to move to question and answers. Um, and I'd like to start by asking the paper authors if there are, if there is anything they would like to respond to um, and any of the points made by the discussants. So, uh, Robert, would you like, is there anything you'd like to respond to? Your yeah, yeah, I would, I would like to. Um, and I uh, want to thank the both discussants and I uh, want to first start off just mentioning one thing that relevant to Kevin's paper, which was also in the chat. We did review a couple of the interventions that um, intervened at the application stage. I want to just make one point that I don't think came out about application interventions, which is that, yes, you might have uh, early interventions which try to assure, uh, enable people to establish employment and not apply in the first place. The said demo was actually concerning people who were rejected as applicants, but uh, you might want to have intervention at the application stage, for, even for people who eventually are accepted and come on to DI. The problem is that uh, before DI, as Kathleen said, you, a lot of these applicants haven't been working for a year. And then you come on, you apply. Some people have a quick decision, other people have a very long decision. So by the time you get on to the rules, you haven't had any contact with the workforce in, in a very, very long time. And then it's a struggle to get back into contact. So if you can interview in the application stage, even for the people who eventually come on and connect them to the world of work and keep them connected, you might have a much better chance of having some success later, even if they do come on to DI. Okay, secondly, thank you, uh, Kathleen and Hillary, for your great comments. And and uh, I, I take it you kind of didn't find surprising or at least certainly accepted the difficulties we face in uh, getting a large fraction of the DI beneficiary population to actually for near significant amounts. The idea that we should be looking at other outcomes is a, is a really great point and certainly has major implications for what we should be measuring in future demonstrations. And uh, I should say that some of these um, uh, interventions have established that. The MHTS application uh, demo did show positive effects on mental health, for example. Let me only make one, one point there, which is that, um, uh, of course, uh, there's the question of what the positive benefits of the uh, uh, cash is that the, the, the DI beneficiaries receive, and let's hope that that cash has uh, some positive effects of some kind uh, relative to the counterfactual, which is not having, you know, that cash. But then I, I think uh, the interesting question would be to focus on these interventions that try to allow beneficiaries to engage more whether it's in DR or employment services or whatever kind of services it is, even if it does not result in earnings and employment above GSGA, does that have positive impacts on their sense of well-being and their uh, fulfillment in life and their confidence in their capabilities simply that they are engaging? And uh, that where I take uh, their suggestions there, uh, and that could be an outcome just looked at uh, in some of these interventions. Finally, let me just say, this, I, I really think this is connected to targeting. Uh, we, Jesse and I said that in our paper, and I emphasize that in our slides. Um, let me just take our point a little bit further, which is that, um, uh, yes, uh, we, we talked about uh, targeting uh, in terms of offering these financial incentives, but what Kathleen and Hillary both said was, hey, these people have lots of other problems <laughs> besides just a financial incentive. They have barriers to work, they have transportation probabilities, they have discrimination in the labor force, they have all kinds of problems that they're trying to deal with at the same time. I don't see us having any interventions which go after those barriers to work. Now, instead of just manipulating the financial incentives, why don't we help people with the barriers that they actually face? And the one demo that's very interesting in that is that MHTS demo for the, 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 uh, for the mental impairments that had a mammoth increase in um, uh, employment from 40 percent in um, employed in the um, uh, control group to 61 percent. They spent 21 percentage points they increase in employment. Uh, and how did they do it? The reason they did it was by packaging a huge amount of services, like 10, 15 different services concentrated on the recipients. They got all kinds of services simultaneously, including individualized employment services. That cost seven thousand dollars per participant. <laughs> okay. So you're never going to do that. But you can imagine really packaging a lot, and the EITC could go with that. You can have a package 
of services, provide a small number of people, and the EITC can be packed, built into that, addressing their barriers to work, and then uh, see how far you can get with that, and simultaneously measuring these other outcomes at the same time. So those are some thoughts I had. Thanks, Kathleen and Hillary, for the great comments. Thank you, Robert. Um, Kevin, was there anything in your discussions, comments that you'd like to respond to before we move on to audience questions? Sure, just a couple points briefly. Uh, I uh, the idea that Robert just brought up about um, trying out a demonstration at the point of application sounds um, very good to me because of the length of time it takes to you know get the application processed and then appeals and so forth. The denial is uh, quite a bit later. And you have uh, the individual there, and uh, you have the contact information. I, I think that's something that maybe uh, SSA should think about. Um, in terms of uh, the, my discussions, um, I, I certainly agree with uh, Jeff about um, we need to be focusing on a broader set. In fact, maybe only focusing on a broader set of outcomes in terms of well-being and health of the uh, recipients, um, certainly a point well taken. Um, in terms of Jennifer's uh, comments, I appreciated the um, more, ex the longer and more detailed explanation of the retained demonstration. I think that's a real exciting um, opportunity for uh, us to learn and uh, see what what types of outcomes will uh, can possibly uh, turn out from these interventions uh, focusing on, on timeliness and uh, case management and coordination so i i appreciated uh, the time she spent on uh, um, talking about how that's rolling out thank you Thanks, Kevin. Um, I want to talk, come back to the topic of targeting. And Robert, you were speaking about this a little bit um, in your response just now. Um, what we're thinking about, when a, a question from, from audience members, when we're thinking about a targeted program for beneficiaries, um, in some ways, Take It to Work is, is a targeted program because people are able to take it up and kind of make it, the, uh, the find the, ideally find the services that they need for themselves. Um, so are there any, do you have any thoughts on how Ticket could be used or modified to test some of the interventions that seem promising um, in return to work? Uh, how to test the uh, targeted interventions, is that what you said? Yes, as, as a way to target, to find a target, find and uh, kind of personalize, individualize services for, for targeted groups. Well, I I mean, I think the hard part is, you know, the targeting itself. And um, if you look at these demos, all the evaluators uh, always did um, subgroup analysis. <laughs> and uh, the subgroup analysis almost never showed any particularly strong group, you know, <laughs> that had a positive impact. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the subgroups they're looking at are very crude, you know, they're like education or only just past employment experience or the type of impairment and things like that. So I, I think I think the really hard part is is figuring out better ways to target, and uh, I suggest that that attempt really has not been made in a serious way, uh, uh, and, and we don't know. But we need demos that try different measures of targeting. We have a lot of history of people when they apply in the first place, when they come on. Uh, we know something about their past SSA earnings. We have some work CDRs, which you have information on whether they you know engaged in work or not. Uh, and we have a lot of, and of course, just asking people, these volunteers, you know, a lot of the demos just ask people, how much are you interested in working, you know, and would never discount people's own uh, uh, views on, you know, whether they want to work or not. So, um, of course, you got to be a little careful there about just uh, offering it to somebody just because they say they want it. We are, you know, independent of everything else. Um, but I'd like to see some demos which really, what's, you could actually do some more analysis right now. I think more subgroup analysis could have been done in some of these demos, really looking, really getting down to the, their characteristics. And that means a data cap gathering exercise to really figure out if there were subgroups that really had positive impacts. So some could be done even with the current data, but certainly with future demos, uh, there's a lot more avenues to do that. The barriers to work they were related to, 
like who has the barriers who has the transportation problems you know who 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 is in an area where there are no jobs you know that that where they can have accommodation or uh, receptivity there are all kinds of dimensions that i think one could look at and that haven't been looked at yeah that's thank you for that answer um i've i've seen prior work that tries to identify people who are characteristics of people who are going to be interested in work or are going to engage in work, but it is very difficult to find it in the data. And I think if we were able to better um, identify and connect with the people who are interested in work, that would be a huge advance. Um, so to turn to a different, um, I, I, I guess an extension on that is, are, are you thinking that this po a policy would then be made available only to a targeted group of people who had been selected and identified, or simply that it would be widely available and some people would take up the program um because that was the program was attractive to them. let me throw out a really radical idea for a program okay <laughs> uh you go in and you say we're going to have this cadillac program which provides a lot of support and we have um we have in the city of houston texas we have 70 slots okay that's it 70 slots okay if you're interested in the apply, okay. If you're interested in apply, and then you sift through the applications and you take take the most advantaged people. You do that across. You have a fixed number of slots, okay. It's not open ended. That way you can control costs, and you can um, now how to do that demo. Well, strictly speaking, the way you do the demo is you ask people to apply, and then you randomize and see people say, yeah, I want to apply, and then they don't get it, you know, because they're going to be unhappy <laughs> about that. But um, the uh, uh, but that's another option, you know, instead of just letting it be open ended. If you let it be open ended, then you're going to get all kinds of voluntary stuff. And like who, you know, like who participated and who didn't, who would in, who in control group would have participated? Who's, what's the right comparison group? You know, what's the selection going on here? If you control the selection <laughs> as a program operator, you have a real leg up on trying to figure out what uh, what the impact is. Just an idea. <laughs> Interesting point. Um, all right, so I'm going to turn to a different question now. Um, so to state Kathleen's point earlier a little differently, um, could it be that the low employment earnings of DI beneficiaries, even with improved incentives and support, um, indicate that the program is working, that is, it is working as social insurance um, to provide income for people who cannot be expected to work? Um, and this question is for all, uh, both panelists and all discussants, um, whoever would like to respond. Well, as I said, I think the, the 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 good question is if you get any impact on employment and earnings, even if it's not above SGA. That MHTS experiment uh, demo on the uh, minimum minimum impairments that had a 41% increase in the employment rate. Uh, sorry, 21%. <laughs> that's not over to do it. Uh, 21 percentage point increase in employment. None of it was over SGA. So. Uh, you know, I think it's successful, uh, and, and you, you had a success there, you know, but somehow it doesn't get counted as a success because nobody left DI or, you know, nobody, uh, um, you know, uh, kind of worked way above high earnings. But I, I, why not count that as a success and say, yes, the program is, is working for the people who, who really cannot achieve any employment, they're getting their benefits, and for the people who can they got they still retain their benefits and uh, if they were below sga that means they had no reduction in their benefits but they did have an increase in their earnings which has all kinds of which has positive effects in and of itself and possibly on their mental health as well so uh, I, I agree you can you can count that as success and say that's the program is working what do you want to to respond Hi, I'll jump in. So I think these programs are working phenomenally well at, at helping people who have suddenly lost income and you know, without them would be in uh, extreme circumstances. I, I think this discussion, though, is about um, a subset of the recipients who it's sort of a shame that all we can offer them is income if they don't work anymore. And the question is whether we could improve 10 or 20 percent of applicants' well-being if we had some other package to offer to them besides lifetime benefits if they never work again. And if we could do more to help people uh, get back on their feet. And so I think I think that these programs are, 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 are incredibly successful in what they accomplish as social insurance. Um, but I think we're all interested in, can they be even better? 
Let me add too that, that this comment on something Hillary brought up was that declining labor force participation rate of men over time, which is a very important point, um, which is uh, there are many different speculations for the reason for that. <laughs> but one of the leading one, in fact, the explanation suggested by uh, David Otter and Mark Duggan was that um, uh, the reason the decline is occurring is because the jobs that are available uh, to unskilled men and women have really gotten worse, uh, offering much lower wages and given all the changes in the labor market with an advanced demand for skills for at least a college education or for high school education, at least some computer skills or IT or you go into junior college or something. If you don't have that, you know, you're, you're, you're really much worse off today than you used to be. And Audrey and Doug, and that was their leading explanation for the rise of the case, though, before the recent fall, you know, back there. Uh, so what that suggests is that, I mean, the disabled are obviously in that category where they're, uh, they're, they're looking for jobs, the jobs that are appropriate for them, even outside of the shelter workshops and, and the competitive labor market, you know, earn skilled jobs. And if those are disappearing or their wages are dropping, um, that just means the hill we have to climb here is getting higher and higher, you know, to uh, uh, find jobs uh, out there that uh, individual disabilities are able to take and earn, you know, amount of, uh, you know, decent return, which makes it financially viable for them uh, to do it. So that's another factor. I think Kathleen brought this up, you know, she brought up discrimination in the labor market. Well, you could say not only discrimination, but just, you know, are there enough jobs out there where employers who are willing to uh, uh, offer the, the jobs of the type that the individual disabilities and those in the DI can can reasonably take, and uh, it could be that those are going down. And and but none of our demos focus on that. You know, none of our demos focus on job opportunities and the wages that are out there. Uh, kind of the pull. You know, it's all push. You know, uh, how to get people off, and none about the pull of how to encourage. It. What about having AITC? You know, off. You know, so if you leave the uh, DI, we're going to subsidize your earnings. Okay, but we'll top it up for three or four years. Okay, because if wages have been dropping uh, out there in the private labor market for the kinds of jobs the DI beneficiaries can get, maybe we should supplement a little while and say, okay, we'll, we'll do this. So there are all kinds of interventions on that side of the market, at least, and, and, and certainly more knowledge needs to be gained on that side of the market than we have right now. Um, one of the, the point of, I think a big question here about turning to non-economic measures as key outcomes is how do we find these in the data and how do we collect data on them and how do we choose which ones are the right ones um, because we need to be cognizant of the fact that having too many measures is not always productive um, because it brings us back to the multiple comparisons issue that Jeff commented on earlier. So I'm curious um, if anyone has thoughts on where we should kind of what are Thoughts on how best to collect this data, or how to how to identify the key, how to identify key outcomes. I know in the uh, in the DMI um, uh, demonstration um, back in two thousand six to two thousand nine, the evaluators had uh, some uh, very specific health. Um, Checklist that they used uh, because the intervention was a healthcare related one. Um, the evaluation report has a lot of information on on health outcomes, um, so there's there's at least um, a start. Um, we are just about out of time, um, so rather than asking a number, another question in our uh, 30 seconds left, I'm going to thank the panelists and discussants. We're now going to move into a short break, and uh, we will be back shortly with the next panel. Thank you.